Hey, boys and girls, this is Don, the Great Southern Brain Fart. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Blow and Wind with the Great Southern Brain Fart podcast. This podcast has been an absolute blast for me, and I hope you all have been enjoying it as well. Do you have a favorite episode? Do you have a favorite couple of episodes? Hell, do you love them all? The best way you can let me know is by leaving a comment or a review over at iTunes or on whatever platform you are listening to the podcast on. I'd really love to hear from you. Be sure to check out the website at www.brainfartinterviews.com and check in with me. This is something I really want to see grow and I want this to become your podcast as much as it is mine. So thanks again for all your support. Thanks again for listening and please spread the word. Well, hey there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Blowing Wind with the Great Southern Brain Fart. This is episode 19, 19, 19. I can't believe it. 19 episodes. You guys are all gluttons for punishment, let me tell you. It's hard to believe that 27 years ago, a little band out of Florida would release a song that would catch my ear and make me a lifelong fan. The name of that band was Saigon Kick, and the song was What You Say. With their spot-on two-part harmonies and the versatile arrangements of their songs, Saigon Kick was unlike any band that I'd ever heard. After picking up their debut cassette, I played it so much that the stereo in my 1988 Toyota Corolla ate it up, and I think it was stuck in there for about two months. When Saigon Kick released the follow-up album The Lizard, they took things to a whole new level, and as a fan, I couldn't have been any more ecstatic. I even met Jason after their show here in Atlanta, and he was a dick to me, but... We'll get to that later, trust me. You'll have to listen on. Hang in there. It's totally worth it. After the departure of singer Matt Kramer, I lost interest in the band, and they just became a band that, in my opinion, had two amazingly awesome albums. I have since discovered the greatness of the post-Kramer era, albums such as Water and The Devil in the Details, as well as guitar player Jason Beeler's odd yet horrifyingly beautiful solo material. Uh, so let me just shut the fuck up and welcome Jason Beeler to Blow and Wind with the Great Southern Brain Fart. So let, let's let's start back for the for the listeners for this story. So I think it was I think it was, God damn it sucks getting old man. It, was it ninety two or ninety three when you guys did the lizard tour and you were you were here in Atlanta you were at the masquerade and it was just before you guys were doing a run of shows with Extreme. I remember because I saw you guys twice on the lizard tour. I saw you at the masquerade and then I went and saw you guys at the Fox Theater when you right, opened right. for Extreme. And um, the Masquerade show was absolutely amazing. It was packed to the rafters. I totally remember. Um, and one of my one of my favorite memories was that there was like like this kind of like group of douchebaggy looking people that were like kind of all up front. And that was probably us. <laughs> so my friend looks at my friend and goes, I bet they're here because of love is on the way. And I, then my other friend goes, those people in for a world of hurt if they think that that's what they're going to open with. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we spent op- quite, a bit, quite a bit of time horrifying soccer moms from coast to coast. Because when you guys came out and opened with the lizard that night, we watched everybody like squeeze out of the front, <laughs> you know, which was just fantastic. But you know, but after the show, I, I, you know, me and my buddies, we wait, waited around, and we were hoping to get you know autographs or whatever from our fa- from one of our favorite bands, and and you, you came out and you, you you like blew like right past me, and you put a guitar pick in my hand. Which now that I think about it wasn't such a dick move that was actually kind of a cool thing because i still have that guitar pick to this day it's good you know, it just says jason on it you know and then the saigon kick logo on the other side and then matt oh, cream cool. then matt kramer came out to and talked you know about jim morrison for about 30 minutes and then got, 
got on the bus, you know? See, now, many, now, many people would think that's being a dick. <laughs> which, is <laughs> kind of, which is kind of funny, because now that I think about it, I was like, I don't know that we even really got to say anything to Matt Kramer. I think Matt just talked at us for 30 minutes and then just left. <laughs> he, was, he, was work, he was working on a college thesis at the time on... Uh, Morris's impact on modern culture. So I think he was just practicing. <laughs> Wait, are you being serious or are you just making this up? <laughs> I was totally making it up. <laughs> See, this is where I got to watch out for you. This is where it's going to get real, son, because I can't, you know, uh, you know you, you're quick on this, man. And I like that, you know. Awesome. So, but and, uh, uh, when, we're, when we're done, I'm going to send you an address because I want that pick back. <laughs> hey, I'll post it on eBay if you want. You can buy it for like, I think, you know, five or six bucks, you know? Um, You're way overshooting the value of one of my guitar picks. <laughs> I was about to say, I will, though, however, send you a picture of me holding it so you can have it. So, but, uh, man, yeah, but Saigon Kick was such a cool band. And they were, I mean, it was one of those odd timings that when the band came out, I just remember thinking, what 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 a unique sounding band for the time that they were coming out, you know, especially with the debut. It was like it came out right before the you know a big shift in the currents, you know. Right. So there was like this, you know, the harmonies and 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 the playing, and then like the kind of you know d- just the versatility of the of the of the album. Um, what was what was it that was behind that? Because I never really got to know what was the influence behind that Saigon Kick well, sound. I, th- I, I think part of it is that we were kind of in a isolated musical climate coming up, like uh, South Florida. So it wasn't like we were in L.A. or <clears throat> or Seattle or New York, where there was kind of scenes per se right. built around stuff. Um, and on top of that, I mean, for me, you know, music's always been music so i don't care whether it's barry manilow or mashuga like if it's good i love it and that's just the way it is i don't i don't not like something based on a genre or for that matter i don't like something based on a genre it's just if this if the music hits me and and i feel it then that's something i like and that's kind of the way we wanted to create records and do stuff um i mean the bands that i loved some of the bands i mean whether it be queen or the beatles or even jane's addiction or you know they weren't really just one thing or you know they kind of you know, maybe not as much as, well, I mean, Queen, obviously, the Beatles did, but, you know, there was just multiple, yeah, I, I would just get bored being, you know, heavy all the time. It's mm-hmm. like, to me, there's, and also, I don't think it's, you know, it's not as impactful. I don't think you can tell how heavy, you know, a band is if all they do is at that same kind of, you know, vibe, because if they don't, you know, give you the, you know, for lack of a better term, the ginger to cleanse your palate every once in a while. It just becomes a blur of of sushi, oh, rather than right. rather than having like oh wow that's really ambient and that's really cool which sets up the dynamic of the heavier stuff or or that's a really dark lyric and that's a really light lyric or that's a really that's always been the stuff that kind of interests me and uh, it didn't really um, make sense to a lot of people I think at the time but it wasn't something that I was even really trying to make sense to people so in the end of the day I think it makes more sense now and I find more people going. Oh, I got it, or I understood what the band was now than I than we did at the time, because I mean we were definitely hated by, and not because I hated the genre or anything. I mean, just but the hair metal bands despised us because we were never accepted by them. Mm-hmm. And, and then I think we were hated by the grunge bands because we were never accepted by them. So we were kind of in this void by ourselves with bands maybe like Kings X and Extreme to a certain degree, and right, right, uh, just kind of in the middle doing our own thing. Because that's funny because I, when I. Uh, let's see that debut album when that album came out i just remember thinking you, you know what well, uh, again it sucks getting old was it 80 no it was, it was like 90 or 91 that the debut came out 91 was 90, think, yeah. okay yeah so i was still like i was still in high school it was like my senior year of high school so like when you're at that age you know where you're like 17 16 17 18 whatever Especially if you're a diehard music music fan, you, you're already starting to kind of say like, yeah, you know what? I'm 
you know, Warrant is stupid and not really doing it for me. Or like you start listening to other things where you're like, you're paying attention to bands like King's X, for instance. Like when I first heard King's X in 90, that was one of the first bands I remember hearing going, wow, this is unlike anything I'm listening to. You know, they're, they're, right. they're, they're doing something really kind of unique and it's not really metal, but it's, it's soul metal kind of hard rock with Beatles. And, and then when I heard you guys, I remember thinking like, Oh, this kind of reminds me a little bit of like Jane's addiction, but like, like the doors and, you know, there were so many different, you know, it was just like this, this melting pot of influence. But I think that like with the lizard, I thought that the lizard took it to a whole nother extreme because you guys even added some of that, kitsch to it you know what i mean where like you did you did some some odd like acoustic numbers and things like that where it just you know and you know you know my dog and things like that where i was like this band doesn't sound like they're trying to make it big <laughs> big you know what i mean no i think we were blissfully ignorant i mean and that's the beautiful thing about being young and not from la so we weren't hanging out with all those bands going like you know top of the pops you know we're gonna make it we're gonna do this i mean we were just kind of like doing our we were <clears throat> allowed to do our own thing and that's what if you look at the south florida scene in particular you had so many unique things come out of there um like you mm -hmm. had nuclear valdez and you had marilyn manson and you had us and you had you know the obviously the miami sound machine stuff and there was a lot of stuff that worked but just there wasn't a scene around it so there wasn't like 50 bands doing the marilyn manson thing there was right. one band, there was one band doing that and um, that was kind of, I think, it, in many ways, kind of cool. Like, and there was, we were all kind of at the same time. So it's kind of weird when you think about it in the sense that most of those scenes, like when you go to L.A. in that late 80s, 90s period, I mean, there was a thousand bands doing roughly the same thing. Right. Um, and, uh, but yeah, but I mean, that, look, that afforded us some really cool opportunities. I mean, I don't know many bands that can say they toured with the Ramones and Cheap Trick. <laughs> <clears throat> you know right. what I mean? And, exactly. Yeah, I totally you know, forgot you guys did that Ramones tour. That was yeah, that, which was awesome. I mean, and then you know, in the same time, we played with Ozzy and you know, and and Soundgarden, and you know, so I mean, we really, you know, not that we fit anywhere, but we got to do a lot of cool stuff that I don't think a lot of other bands would have gotten to do. There was a great band that came out of North Carolina in the. Uh, uh, probably around ninety four. Or so I don't know if you've heard of. Uh, they were called Animal Bag. Um, yeah, yeah, I've heard the name. Yeah, and th they were kind of that same kind of thing. They were like, it's like, are you hippies? Are you metal? Are you hippie metal? Are you psychedelic rock? Like, what are you? And yeah, I've I've been friends with those guys for years. And their singer Luke Edwards said the same thing. It was said, you know, when they got signed, the first thing their a and r guy said it was like we have no idea what the fuck to do with you <laughs> like right. you know, like like do we put you out on tour with you know slayer or do we put you out on tour with jane's addiction you know they did like a they did a long run with ugly kid joe you know and then all of a sudden you know that they, they were doing a run of shows with sacred reich you know <laughs> so that, that's was, one of my favorite I, I remember that conversation clear as day like with jason with jason flom who's been a lifelong friend, but he was the A&R guy back in the day. And, you know, he sat down with me. He's like, Beeler, like, I have no idea what the fuck you guys are doing. Just, I guess, do it, you know, which was really cool. People always ask, like, oh, did the label, I mean, he was just like, I don't know, people seem to like what you do and the shows are doing well and, I don't know, just keep doing that, I guess. Like, there was no, like, maybe if you wrote a few more of this type of song or and even the first record still had a ballad on it um that didn't turn into a hit but it, it, i don't think the format was that there, it's not like the second record we all of a sudden really changed everything um it's kind of the same you know not the same exactly but i think it had the same kind of sense of you know absence of any you know any true north which is you know but i mean look i would totally respect bands that can do that i mean you know, the great thing about ACDC or Iron Maiden or those bands is like, you know, you're going to get that thing and that's what you want and that's what you're going to get. And, and, you know, that's why you go to certain restaurants all the time. So there's an unpredictability and I don't know how popular a restaurant would be where every time you got something different, regardless of what you wanted, you know, it was always something different. You know, so <clears throat> I get it in the big picture, I guess. Yo, yeah, yeah. No, no. That, because there's something to be said about, you, um, bands like the Ramones, ACDC, 
um, you know, where they, they, they accept even, you know, the metal bands, a, a lot of them, they have a working formula. And when you stray from the formula, you, you lose traction. But if you don't really have a formula going into it, then what you've done is you've picked up a fan base of people that appreciate what you're doing, regardless of what you're doing and are just going to not so much just take whatever you're doing and think it's amazing, but they're always going to be open to being saying like, Oh, I don't know what the next Saigon kick album is going to be like, but I like them. So I'm hanging in there to listen to (laughs) to it. You know what I mean? We've been, collectively and individually super fortunate because while you know we're not guns and roses and stature the people who do get it and who do love it have been unbelievably like supportive and and still there and still interested and still show up and still have you know all these kind of you know really cool feelings about the music and you know that's not something that all joking aside it's not something that i take lightly especially in this day and age i mean it's just amazing that you know, even doing the, I've been doing some of these acoustic shows around the country, you know, and, and really having, I've had more fun doing those than I've ever had doing anything. And mostly because the kind of environment it is, it's more like a hang and we're talking and we're bullshitting about the songs and, and, um, you know, and, and hearing what those people, the songs mean to those people or, or what they were doing when they, you know, found the record or this song or that song or why they hate the first record and think the third record is the best or why they hate the third record and think the second record is better or why they, you know, all, all the different dynamics of it make it really kind of a cool uh, thing for me, at least. I think as an artist in general, to be able to have that kind of connection with people and, and now that we're on the subject, I'll just go ahead and tell you, I love the first and second record, but I wish the first wec- record sounded as good as the second record. <laughs> production wise like that's but like what i love about that is that as a fan you can be critical of your favorite bands you know my you know i mean my my favorite band is iron maiden but there's no way in hell that i would ever sit here and tell somebody everything they've done is great everything they've done is perfect like that band has made so many mistakes in my in my eyes as a fan where i would i was just like if that would have been any other band i probably would have given up on you you know, you know the, the, the funny thing about music i think too is, is is especially with certain artists like even if you look at a guy like bowie or or prince sometimes they're ahead of the crowd and things that don't make sense. Like when you wanted that next Bowie song or that next Prince song that like totally came out and like just missed, you know, for you, like you look back 10 years or 20 years later and go, Oh my God, that was like brilliant. Like it was so amazing, but I just wasn't ready for it. Like, you know, uh, um, so it's not that our music, uh, not that I'm equating our records to those records. I'm just saying that it's really the interesting thing about music is that there's songs that, you know, are, are of certain times that, whether the artist intends it to or not, you know, make more sense at different time periods than they do sometimes upon release. And that's just, you know, part of music and part of people hearing it differently. And, you know, who they are at the time is a huge impact on, you know, how they perceive things. Well, it's also part of being older, you know, as, as a music listener, because I, you know, like I told you before, like I've, I've, I mean, I've been a fan of Saigon Kick since the first album came out. And, you know, I can listen to songs now at 44, like, you know, Coming Home, Down by the Ocean, you know, even New World. And you hear it with, you hear these songs with a different set of ears because, you know, you've got, what, 20 something years of life experience behind you. But not only that, you've also got 20 something years of music exposure to go back to because I remember when water came out, I, I didn't like it because I loved Matt, you know, that was like, right. I mean, to, I mean, I mean, and, and I, of course I don't mean this in any, actually I do mean this in disrespect cause I can disrespect you, but anyway, but, um, but well, that's cause Matt told you, gave you a four hour speech on, you know, the, the validity of Jim Morrison <laughs> and I just handed you a pick. So, you know, if I had handed you like some kind of a, well, you know, trinket worth its weight, you know, or maybe a free shirt, you would have praised water from the start and hated Matt. Well, let me tell you, cause I, I, I literally wore that Saigon kick that, that, that 
that that that uh, lizard shirt with the lizard on the cross. I wore that shit till it fell <laughs> fell off of me. <laughs> you know, but 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 the thing with that was was that you know like you. It, it something about water didn't resonate with me at 93 but in, in 93 you know i was i was 21 you know i'm 44 now there's stuff that didn't resonate with me when i was 21 or maybe even 18 that now that i'm older i go oh wow like there's something there that i missed or uh, e- even to like a lesser extreme like I just really got into journey over the past two or three years, you know, and right. discovered like the greatness of like, you know, the, the craft of the songwriting and the voice of Steve Perry. But that was shit that when I was 18, I was like, Oh man, that's pussy music, you know? Right. But like at 44, I'm like, this is incredible songwriting. Well, I mean, you know, that, that, that's, you know, like I said, that's, you know, not to get silly about it, but that's the, 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 the true secret and magic of music is just that it, does different things at different times. And, but there's no, I mean, look, I mean, again, not equating Saigon kick to Genesis, but I mean, there are people that will kill you for saying Phil Collins is, you know, was their favorite version of Genesis because it's all about Peter Gabriel and oh, yeah. that, and that's what they loved. And that's, and there's just, there's just no way their brain is going to make that leap or can accept the fact that, you know, Genesis wasn't its best with Peter Gabriel. And then there's obviously tons of people who feel like who's Peter Gabriel I just know the Genesis hits and that's who I love. And I mean, you know, I never really got hung up in any of that. <clears throat> Maybe to my own detriment. I just, I just, you know, I really still to this day, I just, you know, but I, I never was concerned with being like a, a guy that got recognized in hot topic. I was, Oh my God, that's the guy from Psycho. That just didn't, I mean, being mall famous or, you know, Kardashian esque never really mattered to me. I always just wanted to create music and make music. Um, and, you know, with little thought, you know, with who it's, it's, it's a selfish endeavor for me. Like I just make music cause I, I feel like I almost have to, and, you know, and where those, and certain things resonate and certain things don't. And, and people love this song or they love that song or they hate this or they love Matt or they hate me or they hate me and Matt and they love me, whatever it is. It's like, those are just byproducts. You know what I mean? It's like, to me, I mean, I, it's, it's not something that I spent any time and not disrespectfully to Matt. I'm, I'm just saying like, I just, it wasn't part of my thought process and it was, you know, it wasn't intended to be disrespectful or mean spirited uh, or, Oh, I'm better than Matt or Matt's better. Than, you know, it was n- none of that. It was just like, Hey, I'm going to continue creating the way I created prior and it, it let the chips fall kind of where they do. Yeah. I mean, I, just got off the phone with one of my best friends so i'm i'm a singer songwriter myself i have a band here in town we play kind of just like roots americana music and i played solo for you know 20 something years you know before i had a band and then i we were just having this conversation and i was like you know i was like as much as i love my band as much as i love doing this if they called tomorrow or later today and said hey we're done um i've got a show booked you know, in two weeks, I'm going to play the show. I'm going to play music. I'm going to do it by myself. So regardless, you know, especially when you're the artist who is the, the creator, you know, when you're the creative aspect, you're, you're the, you're the songwriter. You've the one, you're the one that's put, you know, your own blood and tears or whatever, your own stories into it. Those stories need to be told regardless of who's going to be telling them, whether it's going to be you or it's going to be some other mouthpiece. Right. I mean, you're just creating. You, I, I think you know, most musicians I know that I'm friends with are are just, you know, it's just kind of one of those things they have to do. I guess like some people have to get up in the morning and run and some people have to get up and read and some people, you know, writing songs to me is just part of a thing I do. You know, I, I wouldn't know what to do otherwise. I mean, um, and that's what's been cool about doing this, you know, over the last couple of years when I really started to you know, write a tremendous amount again, the, the whole band camp thing has been just amazing. Cause like I've, I've kind of came up with the idea of just being improvisational. I kind of call it improvisational composition in the sense that I would basically write a song and produce it and do whatever else I had to do, sing, finish it and record it and all that crap within 24 hours and then release it. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I didn't want to spend two weeks doing snare reverbs and like, who cares? Like I just wanted to get better as a writer and and the way to do that is to be writing all the time. And then you start to get clearer as to your voice, your aesthetic <laughs> and all those things. So I wound up releasing like 150 plus songs over the last three years. And it's been amazing for me 
Like, and I mean, it's super cool that it's it's kind of taken on a bit of a life of its own, and I'm appreciative of that. And the fact that people are like supporting it is all great, but it's it it would still be in its exact way with nobody paying attention. Exactly. Like, yeah, because you know I mean? as as an artist and as a musician, you have to have that outlet of um, you know you have to have that outlet for your output. And whether it's, you know, I, I feel this, you know, whether 10 people listen to it, whether a hundred people listen to it, if, if my mom listens to it, I don't care. You know, it's like right. it, 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 it has to leave my presence and go out to something. So, because that's what we do. That's why we do right. it. You know, we, it, and it, it, it is a selfish kind of thing because we do do this for ourselves. But at the same time, we also do this as a way to kind of leave some, some sort of a footprint you know, hoping that somebody might, you know, you know, look at it and say, oh, that's kind of interesting. You know, I want to see what's what's going on there. That's always been like, a, you know, obviously that's a super positive thing. And it's always nice to get that kind of reinforcement. But it's really and I don't mean this in a, you know, non-concerned way. It's just like it's not to me, like everyone always asks me, what's your favorite part of the songs? I say the favorite part for me is when I hit upload to to release it like, <laughs> that's mine too <laughs> and, that, and and then the rest becomes like you know it's done it's out that, that i raised that child and sent it out into the world and now i'm on to the next thing so i don't mean to be at all just you know, people say oh i love the first record or i love this people are like, what's your favorite song it's like i i don't have i don't sit back and reflect i mean i appreciate what we've done and what we've accomplished and and it's awesome and but i don't even yeah, I never listen to the stuff that's old. You know, I just and it's not because it's not good. It's just because for me, I'm still worried about how can I become a better musician today. What can I do today that I didn't do as well yesterday? Like, what? How can I get better as a lyricist? How can I get you know more more true? How can I hit you know the, you know what can I do? What chord structures can I bring in that I haven't done before? How can I mm-hmm. be a better guitar player? I mean, that's where my head's at. It's just not about like let me spend the day listening to the first record. Um, and basking in something I did 20 years ago. Um, that doesn't mean I don't appreciate people having such an attachment to it, and it's not in any way being ungrateful. It's just I don't feel like – I don't think I've done my best stuff yet. And that's just me, and that doesn't mean that it has to be a hit for me to feel I've done my best stuff. Um, it's just – I just don't feel like – I don't feel I've created my best stuff yet. See, I think that's a great attitude because, uh, again, like I, I resonate with you in exactly how you're saying that because my band just wrapped up recording our second album. My favorite part of this whole process is going to be when it's done and like it's sitting in at our merch booth. <laughs> Do you know what I right. mean? Because I loved, I love, I love the creative concept, but at the same time, you know, I've already got our next album written. Do you right. know what I mean? So I'm, I'm, I'm like, okay, so this one's not even out, and I've got ten songs in the can that we got to, <laughs> that I want us to learn and work on, you know. Right. So it's that once you let it go, and it doesn't become just you anymore. And I, and 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 I love that you brought up Bandcamp because it's such a sore um, subject to a lot of musicians, especially when you, know, you, you, it's it. This is what I always found interesting. It's it's the musicians like people like Scott Ian and people like that who make a ton of money who bitch about things like that. But it's like guys like you who praise it because you see it for the value of the the artistic measure of it, if that makes sense. Well, I mean, there's there's a few things about that particular back end that I think are brilliant. One is for someone like me who's writing a tremendous amount, I can – release it i don't even and i mean i have a label still that's distributed all over the world so i could have done it that way but i don't want to sit in a meeting and talk to anybody i don't want to pitch a concept i don't want to have to convince a marketing department to do youtube ads or whatever the hell people do these i I don't care about any of that Mm -hmm. and i wanted to just put it up so the immediacy of me being able to finish a song at three in the morning and at 305 a kid in korea is going dude that's a cool song or you suck and should die whatever the point of their comment is (laughs) <clears throat> that that to me is like the most I- intriguing part of it, and the, the 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 other part of it is people have been unbelievably financially supportive through that, which I never anticipated in the first place. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's become shockingly, uh, you know, popular, right? Um, which was never the intent, um, and that's funny. Like I always say, like you know, the second I stop trying, everything takes off. Um, 
Oh, yeah. A matter of fact, I, 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 this conversation I was telling you I had with my friend earlier, I said, I feel like my, my love for being a musician and being a songwriter started once I stopped trying to make a living at it. <laughs> you know, like right. when, once I decided I was like, you know, I'm just going to do this because I love it. I found myself loving it and, and, and embracing it for what it is and for taking it in. And I, I feel like I'm a better musician and a better songwriter than I was when I was playing podunk coffee houses in, you know, North Carolina, hoping that, you know, some guy would hear me or whatever, you know, where like now I'm just like, you know, like my band plays six shows a year. We record an album every year. I have a blast. I've written some of my best material that way. So I, I mean, that, that, I that's agree. the amazing thing about the way the music business is now, and you know, the decimation of the old system is that it's weeded out. It's called the herd of like you know these kind of I want to be a rock star people, and the people I find, especially in the rock and you know maybe jazz and the world, the people that are doing that stuff still and out there working are people who love making music. I mean, it, it, mm-hmm. that's really the sole part for the majority of, of people because it's just not, you know, it's just not an easy thing to do anymore. So to get up and have to do those shows, or even for your, like you're saying, to go load into a coffee shop, or, I mean, you've got to be going, I love making music and I love this whole process. It's not about, because if you don't, you're going to be the most miserable person in the world. You know what I mean? It's, like, it's, 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 hate, it's a hateful experience. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not really passionate about making music. Exactly. And it's so funny. So actually, so there, there's just a, a few topics I want to touch on, though. Um, let's go back to the beginning of our conversation where we kind of jokingly brought this up. And you and I chatted about this. And it was the whole thing about how I, I was jokingly telling my friend Catherine, say, hey, ask Jason Peeler why he was a dick to me in 92 <laughs> or 93 or whatever. Um I have talked to a few musicians in the past about stuff like this. And obviously there are these moments where there's just like, uh, you know, it was a bad day. I I had a cold. I wasn't feeling good or whatever. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is that like at the height of Saigon Kicks popularity, especially like with the Lizard album, you guys were doing a lot of touring. You guys were, were there moments where you kind, kind of found yourself it, in, in, a, in a place where you were like, wow, okay, uh, like where you could sense that you weren't really the person that you wanted to be. Does that, am I making any sense where I'm going yeah, I with mean, that? I mean, I think I know, I think I know what you're asking about. And I mean, first of all, it, 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 and I'm not saying this because like I'm some kind of saintly great person, right. but I, I really, I pride myself on always spending time, whether it be online or in person or at shows talking with everybody 99.9999% of the time. Mm-hmm. I don't think you'd be able to find a group of people going, Oh, he's such a dick. Um, but maybe you can, I don't, I mean, I, 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 I don't know, but there's um, probably a Facebook group about it. There probably is a, you know, someone kill Jason Beeler Facebook group. Uh, but <laughs> Jason Beeler's a dick United, you exactly. know, <laughs> it's a union. There's like a $35 a year membership. You get a little, you get like a, a target with my face on it and all kinds of cool little souvenirs. a back patch. You know? But, um, so, I mean, you know, I was always, at least I always tried to be, I mean, I'm right. not saying that there wasn't a moment where, you know, my wife had just screamed at me for doing something stupid or whatever, or, or my manager just informed me that the new record tanked or, you know, or, or, and I was walking past somebody and maybe wasn't as engaged as I could have been due to, uh, things like that. But I mean, I always really, I can only say, I always try to be in the moment mm-hmm. and be, and be appreciative of people, um, and try to try to spend time where applicable. I mean, I, I know it gets harder and harder because, you know, especially when we were doing stuff like that, because, you know, you're, you're, you're getting up, you're being dragged to four different radio stations, which are inevitably, you know, an hour and a half in the wrong direction compared to where you want to be. Um, and then you have to sit there and you have to sit there and talk with like, you know, boner and the jive man, who's going to ask you the same stupid questions. What's the craziest thing that ever happened to you yes. on the road? <laughs> all these stupid questions that you're just sitting there like, you know, it, 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 that, you know, that part of it can become, uh, you know, again, you're lucky to be doing it, but it can become slightly mind numbing uh, at times. But yeah, I mean, 
So, I mean, not that I've ever, I, I don't think that I've ever like lost total control. Right. Um, right. Personally, but I, I mean, again, we weren't Metallica sized. We had some success and it was great, but um, I can only imagine the demands on, you know, Dave Grohl's day or, um, you know, you know, it, I'm sure that's got to be an insane juggling act to be the guy that everybody expects to be this, you know, Dave Grohl is the best friend of America. Right, right. And, and for some reason, if his kid just got in trouble at school and he got a FaceTime from them and then he's walking in the hallway and he's not your best friend, it's hard. You know, it's so funny. That makes a lot of sense because uh, I remember after it happened, me and my buddies were driving home and we were kind of talking about it because, you know, me and my friends were typical music dork kids, you know, like, you know, we, you know, we were we were a mighty group of three that were the same three friends all through high school, you know, and we went to the shows together and our buddy Phil was sitting in the back seat and he goes, maybe he had to play like Love is on the Way three times today at the radio station. <laughs> You know? And we were like, and my buddy was like, yeah, that put me in a bad mood. <laughs> you know? Exactly. See? So, you know, but I mean, but, but to kind of go forward with the, what you're talking about with the acoustic tour, is it, which I, I again, I, I remember I told you I hated missing it and you were like, hate's a strong word, but I really do hate that I missed it because my band was playing and it was one of the few times in my life where I actually considered canceling a gig to go to a gig. <laughs> Go to well, a gig. <laughs> but now we're even because you're saying I blew you off at the masquerade and now you blew me off in, you see, at my show. So, like, we're even. Technically. You see, now it has all been canceled off. Didn't even, I don't even have a pick of yours. So, I mean, I think I got ripped off. You know what? So now, so you know what? Now we now we can cancel it out, and now we can really be friends. You know. Okay. So, but I owe you a pick. So you know, yeah. um, you know, we'll we'll, we'll 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 divvy that up. But I've just added that to my to do note in Ever Evernote. Uh, so you will uh, your pick <laughs> your pick debt shall be repaid. <laughs> but. I heard so many great things about the acoustic show here in Atlanta. I, I, I I've seen the footage. I've, it, it was so much fun. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it. Uh, Jeff Tate from Queensryche earlier, uh, actually it was either earlier. It was last year, I think he did. Um, see, this is what happens when you get fucking old. You, your years run together. He did a full on acoustic tour of uh, Queensryche material where he did it in a storyteller setting. There's something special about being able to take music that in my mind and in my ears is complex. And again, I'm not comparing you to Queensryche, but whenever I listened to Saigon Kick material, there was so much music to it. It was so much, there were so many depths and so many different dynamics to it that for you to be able to just strip it down to that acoustic point where it was well, that, just that's you. Been the that's been the fun thing is just been, you know, I mean, the bottom line is you always hear it as a musician is like, you know, a great song will work with just a man and a, you know, a wash tub right. or whatever, you know? Yeah. And, uh, there, there's, there's some truth to that. So taking the songs apart down to the elements, the core melodic elements of it, and then sitting there and going, okay, does, does this work? Or if it's not working, how can I make it work? Uh, has been unbelievably fun and, and musically challenging, um, and just great. And, um, like you said, I mean, the most important thing is like the people who are showing up to these shows are super passionate and know everything about every record and why and how and how it was supposed to go and who didn't do this. And, um, and just getting to talk to them and tell them stories. It's not so much a, it's more like an interactive. It's literally like I come to your living room and we're just hanging out and, you know, I, I, depending on what's going on, I change up the songs or do different stuff or stop or people sing along or, you know, it's been, I, I gotta tell you, I mean, and I've done a lot, fortunately, uh, as a musician, but it's been the single most rewarding musical thing I've done to date. Like I've never had more fun uh, than I'm having now. See, and it's funny because that's exactly what Jeff Tate told me when I talked to him after his acoustic show here in Atlanta. He said, this was such a special way for me to do these songs. He says, cause he said when um, Chris DeGarmo and I sat down and we wrote Queens Reich songs, he said, especially starting with the empire album, he said, they looked at each other and they said, these songs should be written so that they could be stripped down to the very essence of the song and it be played on an acoustic guitar or a piano and just a vocal and that right. everything else should just be color, you know? And so with, with that being said, I mean, 
uh, I haven't paid a whole lot of attention to the set list because I'm sure you're kind of switching it up every now and then, being that it's just you. Have there been particular songs from the Saigon Kick catalog in the past that you've looked at and said, there's absolutely no way this is going to work, that I, can, <laughs> that I can do this? Or that you feel challenged enough that you said, you know what, I'm going to fucking do that? Yeah, I, I've. I mean, what I've done is I, I call it like Twitter versions. So mm-hmm. I don't play like because I want to. There's so much music that people want to hear that I'm doing like you know shorter sections of or like kind of combo like medleys of things. And mm-hmm. uh, but there's not much I don't get to, um, you know, in a set. I mean, so I'm probably playing like forty plus pieces of songs in different you know and obviously throwing in a few covers of things that i really enjoyed and uh and i'm always mixing it up so there's nothing i've encountered yet where i'm like no way there's just a i only have so much time right and uh, you know you know, play a two hour show or two and a half hour whatever it is um you know we could sit there for another three hours and still not get through everything but every show i've done so far has you know the set's been different and um yeah i just went back to new york and boston uh, about a week or so ago and um, you know I, that's the second time I've played New York and uh, you know the cool thing is the shows are actually growing which is you know not that you wouldn't hope for that but it's it's you know in a day and age where people have a lot of shit to do the fact that you know I went to New York did really well went back and did even better is amazing to me right right which I hope you'll come back to Atlanta and have it be just I, as I, good I, to- I, already, I already am really do you have a date I do November 16th I believe well, I am. I promise not to book a gig that night. <laughs> sure, I cannot wait for the Facebook notice. I'm so sorry, dude, but you know, I had I didn't expect it. But we're adding the uh, tuba orchestra to our new record, and uh, the, guy, the guy was only available during uh, your set. But and just for the record, listeners, Jason Beeler was just a dick to me. <laughs> See how this goes? <laughs> That's how it works. So, you know, uh, and another funny thing I always like to talk to when I'm, whenever I'm talking to uh, folks. Um, and by the way, I have to say, I'm enjoying the hell out of this, Jason. This is really oh, awesome, fun, man. man. Um, well, let me toughen up here and get a little more rude. <laughs> I don't want to end on a high note. Well, so. remember, I was about to I'll tell you, I was, I, was, I, was, I was hoping it would only be a moderate waste of your time. <laughs> as opposed to, you know... <laughs> But um, it, it, you've been obviously doing press for for decades. I mean, like, is there is, is are there specific topics, questions, things that, like you said, that, that like just come up that you're just like, oh God, just kill me now, or you know, no, I mean, or no, or, or are you just like, oh, come take me now? Ha ha ha! Fun. <laughs> What world? What what a master of the language! What a wordplay smith, if you will. I'm a pretty big pun king, by the way. I have to I have I, to warn you. You know, I, I enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> for me, what I try to do with any press I'm involved with, um, and it's a it's a, it's really annoying, probably to any kind of journalism majors, and especially anybody who prepares for something extensively, because I immediately try to turn it into a conversation. And that's where I think the best stuff happens for both of us. Um, if someone comes like prepared, like I can tell they're going, and so in 1993, you wrote this song. <laughs> Why? And then that's, and then, and then like they're, you can tell they're not even listening to the answer because they're prepping for the next part of right. the thing they wrote down. That to me sucks and is boring. And I do everything in my power to, to ruin their day um, by just going on completely irrelevant nonsensical tangents um and knowing that they're gonna have to later transcribe it in some form uh, see i fucking love that because that's actually why i started doing this podcast was because i used to do all my interviews just like how we're doing this now and what would suck was that i would have to transcribe it and then i would realize you know because i i prefer conversations obviously you know like i like talking and i like having that conversation that connection with the person sometimes they don't want to connect with you sometimes they do but I, I i've noticed that since i've done this so far everybody i've talked to has preferred to do it in a conversation type mode but the well, I mean, problem, if you look at the brilliant if you look at the brilliant interviewers i mean in my opinion like a david letterman or a or a stern or you know i don't think he gets enough credit for his interviewing skills but it's um oh, he's incredible it, 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 yeah. He turns it into a conversation, and that's where you're going to get, I think, interesting stuff out of anybody. Um, 
when you're talking. When, oh, you know, yeah. Because if, if you're hitting them with you know prepackaged questions, you know odds are that Dave Grohl has been asked the same fifty questions a billion times, so he can actually be thinking about like, okay, I got to go work out later, and still be answering your question because he just knows where that flow is going to go. But if you start talking um, and letting that roll, I think you get you know, which is what I would hope. Any interviewer, that's what I would want to do as an interviewer, is I want to know the person I'm talking to and find out stuff that not everybody else is getting. Uh, oh, yeah, and that's, and that's exactly what I try to do with this because it's so funny because I drive real journalists fucking up the wall. I'm not a journalist, man. I didn't study journalism, obviously. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not a radio broadcaster, obviously. I'm a, I'm, I'm a musician who is also a writer, you know, so I, right. ha- I I have a general interest. Like I was that kid, you know, in the eighties when I would be reading like the metal magazines and I would be reading the interviews and I would and I would think to myself, this interview fucking sucks. This is what I would ask Bruce Dickinson. Like, why hasn't anyone asked Bruce Dickinson what he sings in the shower? Like, this is the kind of shit I want to, <laughs> you know, right. what I mean. And like, so you know, to have a conversation like this with someone like you is 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 is, is cool because I can see that you embrace that. So. Just the overall concept that, like you said, what bugs you is what seems to bug you is just an interview, <laughs> you know, as opposed to a conversation. Right. I mean, a straight. I mean, you know, it, you know, you might as well just email the questions at that point. You know. Oh yeah, yeah, and you know, and so of course, I mean. I was super excited when Saigon Kick reu- like reunited, you know, a, few, a couple years ago, and there was an Atlanta date, and then the Atlanta date got canceled, and then I was like, Yo, "That's because uh, that's because I knew you were coming." I was gonna say, I was, I was like, "Beeler's a dick to me again," because he knew I knew I still lived in Atlanta, and so he he, he fucked me over. <laughs> Not that guy again. <laughs> You're like, oh, I'll show that dude. I'm just gonna make the whole city pissed at him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but like uh, uh, th- th- those reunion shows were really well re- received and i i again went online saw the footage i thought they were fantastic um from your pr- from your standpoint how do you feel that they went did they did they did, do you feel like they were there was something beneficial to him or was this kind of a, a closing of a chapter or something? Because obviously, you know, you know, Matt had not been in the band for a while. You, you'd gone on and, um, you know, made a few albums, um, without him. And then all of a sudden he was back in the fold and you guys were doing some shows. Um, what, what can you just tell me about that? I mean, just like, like I said, from like artist to fan who, who doesn't really know, you know, yeah, it's not like there was well, a whole I mean, lot of press about it, you know? No, no. Well, there's two pers- things about it. One, it was amazing to kind of end. I wouldn't say we're done because we're, we're not doing anything, but we're not like we didn't break up again or anything. I mean, we kind of purposely knew this was going to be a limited run and let's just kind of slowly do what we do. Um, so it was fun to, you know, end on a better note uh, just on a personal level because there was quite a bit of time there where um, – really the only thought was how can I stick a sharp implement into his cranium or vice versa. Um, so to get to the point where we didn't want to kill each other, was awesome. As he stopped like, talking about Jim Morrison, probably because he kept doing the same thing over and over again on Jim Morrison. <laughs> and there's only so much. I was like, I get it, dude. He's a lizard King. I get it. You know, uh, but um, so, but anyway, so getting back with him and Phil and everybody and, 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 and getting that to be a positive uh, outcome and, and at least get socially in a positive sense was awesome. And then, um, you know, it also drove home certain thoughts of like why we probably shouldn't do this on a larger scale or for a longer period of time, because I think a lot of the same issues he probably has with me and that I have with him, uh, are still right there. Um, mm-hmm. So I just have a work ethic and a way of doing things. And so does he. And I think we've done some cool stuff together, but, um, you know, and I think if shows come up in the future that we want to do, we'll do it. Mm-hmm. And um, but you know, there's no like agenda or anything, you know, up and beyond, you know, that kind of place. Because I also realize, like, you know, anybody who cares about the band, you know, I, I, I don't want to be one of those bands that's like, okay, we're making a new record and it's going to come out on blah 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 label, and and then people are so excited, and then we don't put the, you know, my mind is like, again. I want to make a record that's better than anything we've ever done. And that's hard to do under the best of circumstances. Right. Um, right. 
and let alone you're also the bar is so much higher because you could make a really good record but there's so much emotion and anticipation attached to that for the people who care that it's um you know it, it, it's it's just something that I, I don't think we're in the creative space to do and exceed at that so i'm gonna keep doing what i do i'm sure he's gonna keep doing what he does and when the stars line up we'll we'll do more and and if they don't, we won't. I actually think that that is such a cool thing because there's something to be said about the expectations that are set by fans for bands, especially when there's been a rift, especially when there's been a split up. Like, I, I was in a metal band in, in the 90s with these three other guys, uh, you know, two of whom I was, like, best friends with in high school. We hadn't seen each other in, God, over 20-something years. And somehow we all reconnected on Facebook and found out we have very little in common and they, but they were like, let's just get together and hang out and catch up. And we ended up having a jam session in the basement and I walked out of there and I was like, you know what? That was a great closure for me. Then that was a great last memory of playing with them. Then it was the last time I played with them when I just fucking stormed out and told them to all go eat shit, you know, back in like 94. But I don't have that desire to go do that again. Do you know what I mean? And I get it as a fan because even like, you know, like as a fan, like, you know, I totally understand the Skid Row should shut the fuck up and Sebastian should be the singer and that's the way it should be. And everybody else should, you know, as a fan, like I don't care who hates who and why and who I don't care about the time you have to spend with that person you know, touring or being creative and that you hate each other. That's irrelevant to my world. I just want you to do what I want. Dance, monkey, dance. Uh, (laughs) As a fan, I totally get that. On the other side of it, you know, life is what it is, and it's too short um, to not embrace pursuing things that you're really passionate about and, and, and feel good about what you're doing. And some people don't understand, like, oh, well, you know, if you did this, you could play in front of, you know, 5,000 people a night and you could do this and you can make that much money and or whatever. And, you know, to me, it's like, yeah, but, you know, I have money. I, I don't care. Like, I just I, I just want to do what I do. And I just I, I mean, I'm a, I am a joy seeking missile. And I don't mean that in the sexual innuendo sense. I just mean that. I. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> I, I just want to be around people that, you know, inspire me, make me better. And I want have as much fun as possible and be in positive situations and things that don't add to me creatively or on a personal level, uh, I'm eliminating and that's selfish, but that's how I, that's how, I, that's how I roll as they say in the hip hop world. No. And, and to be honest, that's not selfish because what that is, is that, that that's what allows you to move forward as an artist, as a musician, as, as a human being and to, um, because I feel like too many bands actually adhere to the expectations of their fans and they reunite and they go do the monsters of rock cruise and whatever. And you're looking at them on stage and you're like, I can totally tell these guys hate each other. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Absolutely. And it's well, like, that was so- the point that we, we did, we did the monsters of rock cruise, strangely enough. Right. And right. The, the cool, but, but the, the, the thing that was interesting to me is like a lot of those bands I had never really seen or been a part of or toured with. And there were bands on there that I was absolutely like, Holy crap. Those guys are really so much better than I ever thought. Like I never even thought about that band being great. And then there was the, definitely the contingent of bands that you speak of that are like, Oh dude, really? Like you're 65 in like stretch pants and like white pa- pancake makeup. It's just <laughs> your hair is dyed black. There's something to be said for being Keith Richards and cool. Like you know you're getting old and he's cooler than he's ever been. Like his face has got so much character. But there's something about being 65 or 70 and like thinking you're fooling everybody. Oh, like you're 30. Oh. And there's a sadness to that. That um, yeah, it's just it just it, it makes me feel like I don't know. I'm like witnessing a a slow motion death. <laughs> Look, I always said something. I would much rather be 80 years old and playing brown sugar than be, than be 60 years old and be singing cherry pie. That's just my opinion, you know what I mean? Like, it's just so you're being kinda... such a dick. I mean, I... <laughs> well, so and so my last thing that I always wanted to ask you about, and I'm sure this is one of those one of those journalist questions. You're gonna be like, oh my god, he's a journalist, but no, I'm not. But was um was the was love is on the way. Obviously, yeah. that song was written for a fucking reason. Like that was that. I mean, it, it's a beautiful fucking song. I remembered when I heard it, 
you know, I bought I bought the lizard the day it came out, and I looked at it as just another facet of Saigon Kick. I didn't look at it as like, oh my god, they're selling out. I looked at it as like, oh, this is Saigon Kick doing something kind of off the cuff, you know? So was that was was that what that was about for you with that song? Or was that kind of something that was a little pushed for outside no, of you? Not at all. I mean, if you look at the first record, you referenced Come Take Me Now, you know. Oh, you know, my that, God. That, Colors, Come Take Me and, Now. Like, I, I don't know why those songs weren't hits. Do you know what but I mean? Those were, but those were on the first record. I know. And it didn't work. Um, so... It, it, to me, like I always write, I'm always writing. Um, and at that song, of all the songs I've written, like that song happened really quickly. Like I was, I remember specifically because I was sick, and there's a demo of it I have somewhere. I, I wrote it all in one piece. Literally, the whole thing basically came to me, and like 90% of the lyrics and everything like that just happened at one time. Uh, but we had no concept that that was going to be a hit or work or, you know. It's just what we do. And, and I would do it. And, and on top, people are always like, oh, you think it ruined your career? And I'm like, well, I mean, am I supposed to sit here and apologize for having a platinum single? I mean, I wrote the song. We played on the song. Like, no one snuck up and said, hey, play this at gunpoint. Like, we wrote the song, and and, and people really related to it. And, and it's great. But we still did My Dog, like you said. We still did The Lizard. We still... So I don't think peppermint. Like, the, like, I always thought it was so funny is that, like, you, you get, like, My Dog, Peppermint Tribe. Love is on the way. The lizard, you know what I mean? So it's like, to yeah. me, that was classic Saigon kick. That was like, okay, we have no idea where this is going to go. It was like, it was like such a bipolar kind of moment. And it's still, if you listen to the stuff I'm doing, I mean, now, not that I'm trying to pitch stuff, but hey, by the way, my new products are available. And if you act now, but um, if you listen to the stuff I've written on the Bandcamp site, uh, you, you know, you'll see it's, it's, I think it's just the natural extension of what I've always done. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just what I do. I write really, I mean, the thing that, I mean, maybe I'm not writing as heavy a stuff as I wrote just because I think as I've matured, the bro rock heavy aggro stuff is just not as alluring to me. I prefer, I prefer writing super melodic stuff with horrifyingly uh, grotesque lyrical content. Um, this way, like as a, as an artist, like people, go, Oh, that's such a nice song. And then they realize it's about like dismemberment and embalming and whatever. But I like to mask these kind of horrible topics inside pop music. That's my new kind of pet thing. Um, which, rather than just maybe the heavy stuff. Which so if anything, fun, I've, yeah. I've gone, <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. That's more of where my head's been at lately. Um, but I'm, I'm going to do a super heavy record, you know, in the not too distant future. I'm actually talking about working with this guy uh, who's from Atlanta. Uh, I don't know if you know Kevin Scott. Yes. Bass. Yeah. We're, t- we're talking about writing together shortly. Who's, by the way, like the greatest bass player in modern times. So actually, so in closing, because I actually wanted to use this as the encore, was to actually talk a little bit about what you're doing and what it is that you're doing and and your your releases. So like like tell ta- tell ta- just spill. Tell me about it. Tell me about I mean, it. Basically, jasonbeeler.bandcamp.com has those 150 songs I referenced earlier. I'm always releasing them and writing them and putting them out. You can listen to them all for free. You can support should you decide to be a more noble person uh, and, and, and do so, but there's no obligation. And, um, I'm just being creative all the time. So I'm talking about doing a new project with move Jonathan mover, the drummer and, uh, Steven Gibb, who was with black label society. And, uh, Oh man, Bar- mover is Barry- an incredible drummer. What a great uh, drummer. He's just mind numbingly brilliant. So actually that's who I'm talking about doing with Kevin Scott was me and, uh, and Jonathan mover and maybe Steve Gibb and do something. Our, our combination of the, the, the thought I have in my head is to do like a Meshuggah meets jellyfish. Uh, album which by the way i'm a huge jellyfish fan Me too. <laughs> I love, I, so. see we were supposed to be friends all along yeah, all along uh, all along <laughs> i gave you like a a token i didn't want to speak to you because i thought my words would fail to give you the emotion so i gave you a token of my heart that was held in my hand and warm <laughs> by my own body temperature and it just like it was an acknowledgement of your brilliance and you just simply called me a dick do you know what it was right. that pick was a key to what just happened today it's a portal it's a it portal was, it totally so, was i love this it, this is some like ancient aliens level shit right here you know i'm telling you right now this is as close as i've been to a man uh in terms of uh developing a relationship since that weird shower i took with phil verone <laughs> which we should have a whole other 
the podcast about? Because I'm sure that's <laughs> that could that could fill an hour pretty easy. Well, so you did, and then finally you did mention that you got uh, that you're going to be uh, doing another run of uh, solo shows. So um, t- tell me yeah, what you, I can expect from it, since I haven't seen it yet, or anyone else I'm who a hasn't seen pitch it. Man, uh, I will just say that if you go to my website or my Facebook page, which is you know if you look up Jason Bueller, you'll find me pretty easy. Or Twitter, I mean, it's all up there. But yeah, I'm still continuing to do. I have LA coming up. Um, you know, a back a few days to Florida, have Atlanta coming up, um, and just continue to expand that stuff. And, you know, just making music and being creative, man. Like I said, I've never had more fun. So as long as it's fun, I'm going to keep doing it. Man, Jason, this was so awesome to get to talk to you, man. And I'm so glad we we now have a bond. And, uh, Absolutely. And, and you're you're an awesome dude, and you've made some of my favorite music. And well, I, I I really enjoyed getting to talk to you and getting to know you, man. I really appreciate well, you taking the time. Likewise, I anxiously anticipate being tagged in a Facebook post saying how wrong you were about me, and that I was single. One of the single greatest moments of your life has been being proven wrong by the noble and charismatic Jason Beale. <laughs> Je- I mean, do your own thing, but that's just my thought. That's Baron Von Veeler. Yes. I will make sure that you are tagged. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> well, thanks again, man. And, uh, and hopefully we can do this again um, soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the time, dude. Thanks, Jason. Have a good one, bud. You too.